Greetings viewers. Quite a while back I said that when we hit a thousand subscribers I would do a video covering the self-defense shooting I was involved in many years ago. So that day has arrived. So thank you very much to those of you who have subscribed for all the likes, all the views, all the constructive criticism and feedback in the comments. Little conversations back and forth, dropping some information for me and other people. It's very much appreciated, so thank you. Anyway, that's not what you're here for. You're here to listen to me talk about something that happened back in 2008. It is now 2024, so again, it's been quite a while. I was in my 20s at the time, and now I'm in my 40s. So the incident happened in traffic while I was in Jacksonville, Florida. At the time, I was on active duty stationed at the Naval Air Station there. It was on the weekend. I was on my own free time with my girlfriend at the time, who I am not still currently with. We had actually just finished at a shooting range that was off of 103rd. If you were familiar with the Jacksonville area, not necessarily a great part of town, but we were just passing through. So I'm gonna switch views here a little bit, give you more of a dynamic explanation of what happened using some uh, little Hot Wheels cars. So this is as good of a representation of the traffic as I can set up with these little cars here. Back in this day, people didn't all pile into the left lane, so traffic actually built up further in the right lane, less in the middle and less in the left lane. So. This uh, little silver car represents me. This little purple car here is the other people's vehicle that were involved. So the right lane was all backed up. So here I come in my 2000 Ford Mustang, driving up the middle lane. And as I get to about here on these guys' car, they decide they're tired of waiting in traffic. So they decide they want to get over while I'm still occupying this lane. So this guy swerves, almost takes off the front of my car. I knew that the left lane was clear, so I immediately switched over, start driving. We're basically parallel at this point, and somebody does the same exact thing to him. So somebody from the right lane decides, oh, I want to get over. So he tries to get over while I'm already here passing him, has to slam on his brakes, scoot in behind me. So after that, we drive for a little while. He is tailgating me so close that I can't even see most of his vehicle because he is right on my butt. No surprise in Jacksonville traffic. Eventually, in the far left lane, I come to a stop behind a blue car. So here I am behind the blue car. I've got the nice little gap here because uh, I have been rear-ended before and I didn't want to get smashed into that car, so I left some space here. I then realized that this became a turn only lane up ahead and I did not want to go that way. So I realized I needed to get in this lane. Traffic started flowing. We were at a standstill, I'm guessing people waiting to turn left. So I started looking in my side view mirror, making sure it was clear. I put on my turn signal, started creeping up. Once I got far enough out in front of his car and was trying to creep out, he whipped out and did one of these and blocked me in. So I've now got a car behind, in front of me that I'm stuck behind. He's at an angle like this, traffic is stopping behind him, stopping behind me, so I've pretty much got nowhere to go at this point. Right here to my left is a at least a foot high concrete median. There's no way with the uh, my low car I would have been able to jump that. And besides that, it was a very thin median. And on the opposite side of that, we've got oncoming traffic that was pretty much nonstop. So there was nowhere for me to go, and I'm pretty much stuck at this point. So as I'm sitting in this position here, he is hanging out of his window, honking, screaming something. I can't hear him because my windows are closed. My girlfriend is in the passenger seat at this point, kind of freaking out, telling me don't open the window. Oh my gosh, just kind of shaking her hands around, scared. We waited and waited. He's honking his horn, still screaming, honking, honking and just continues and traffic is not moving at this point. All right, so he's honking and he's shouting and shaking his fist. I can't understand what he's saying. He's not moving, traffic's around getting pissed because nobody's going anywhere. So out of pure frustration, I tap my passenger side window to roll it down. It rolls down maybe two inches or less. I didn't have the uh, auto down there, so it just went down as far as I held the button. So now she's definitely freaking out. She's screaming, she's shaking her hands, she's trying to like kind of hide from the situation. There's not really anywhere for her to go. And now at this point, technically she's in between me and this other guy who also has a passenger in his vehicle. So I look at him and I say, what? I'm frustrated at this point, I'm upset. This guy almost smashed into my car twice because he's not paying attention. And now he very clearly thinks that I'm at fault and it's something I did wrong. So I'm not exactly very pleased at this moment. So. I'm gonna repeat his words and I quote what he said was, motherfucker, you do some shit like that again, I'm gonna snatch you out your ride and I'm gonna straight murder you and your girl. So I'm a little confused at this point because like I said, I, I did nothing wrong 
So if I dodge an accident with you twice, you're gonna kill me for, I, I don't understand, but I, I'm pretty pissed off. There's a lot of colorful responses that I would like to make at this point, but I'm not trying to make things worse, but I am, again, also, the adrenaline's still going from dodging the accident because it happened pretty quickly. So after he says the, all those colorful words, my response is limited to, that's nice, can you move your piece of shit car now so I can go? Probably could have said a lot worse things, probably could have said a lot better things. I feel like uh, given the circumstances, that was pretty, uh, pretty muted from what I again could have said. So now he gets really upset and he says, what? And flings his car door open. I kind of went like, uh, for a second because of his angle and how close he was to me, I thought his door was gonna smack into my front quarter panel, which thankfully it did not, and starts approaching my vehicle from the front like this. He then puts his hand up under his shirt, indicating to me that he has a weapon or is pretending he has one. Irrelevant at that point, I'm gonna assume that you do. And he gets to about right here. And he's, he's watching me the whole time and I reach down for my concealed weapon that I was carrying in the small of my back on the right hand side. And when I did this, I'm assuming that he thought I was taking my seatbelt off, maybe to get out and fight, I don't know, because he removes his hand from here and does like this, like he's kind of getting ready to fight. And as he's about here, I've now got my pistol up where he can't see it from his angle, but it's, it's out now because I've made the decision that if this guy gets to my door and starts trying to open it, I'm just gonna shoot him through the window. I, I drew that line in the sand. I, I made that decision on the spot. I'm now trapped here. I can't leave her. I can't drive anywhere. I can't do anything. Accelerating to, to hit him would have done nothing because the amount of space that, that was there, it, I'm sure someone's gonna say shoulda, coulda, woulda done that. It, it wasn't practical at the moment. So I had made my decision what was gonna happen. She now sees that I have my gun ready to go and screams, don't pull out your gun, which now causes him to very wide-eyed go, oh crap, immediately turns around and bolts back to his vehicle. So his door's wide open. I can see directly into his car and I see him get in like this. He jumps in, says something to his passenger and then all I see is him doing this, diving between the front two seats into the back. So now I'm thinking to myself at this point, okay, that probably could have gone a lot better, but it also could have gone a lot worse. They're trying to get away. This is over with, scared him off. He, you know, heard there was a gun, so he's trying to get out of Dodge. Problem is, whatever he said to his passenger, I'm assuming was along the lines of that I had a gun. And immediately the passenger opens the glove box and starts to come up with a I can see clear as day, black revolver with brown wooden grips. I swear I could have almost read the serial number off of that thing because I was so fixated on it the second that it basically came into play. And now essentially there's known two guns in the fight. Not a, no idea what the driver is doing in the back seat, potentially getting a third gun. So now this is a really bad situation because again, I have a essentially human shield between me and them now. She doesn't want anything to do with this, but she's kind of trapped and can't go anywhere and can't do anything. So at this point I have no choice. I saw the gun come out and it's making a sweeping motion towards me. I don't think he was bringing it out to hold up and say, hey, look what I've got here. It was definitely sweeping coming towards me and before he was able to actually point it at me and get to about here, I had no choice. I had to shoot at this point. It's, it's now or never. I'm not going to let her get hurt or killed. Maybe I wasn't going to take any rounds because they hit her. Who knows? Uh, I wasn't going to take that risk. So I just brought my handgun up, pointed. I was still within the range of the vehicle. Um, unfortunately, it, the gun was directly in her face like this. She ended up having uh, three red marks on her forehead from the brass coming out because again, I had no choice. I had to do something. So I fire one round at the passenger who was holding the revolver like this. I see him kind of fall back and I saw the window behind him crack. I remember seeing kind of a red blood spray. And in my mind, I thought to myself, I said, I remember thinking exactly, headshot, where'd the other guy go? Like basically that guy's out of play, he's done. Where's the, where's the other guy? So the windows of their vehicle were fairly dark tinted. However, I could still see a silhouette. And when I looked to this rear driver's side door, I could see a silhouette shape. And it was not simply a neck and head like hey, let me see what's going on. There was definitely this kind of action going on here where you could still see the shoulders were rolled up, kind of like a uh, 
long distance rifle target in the military, for those of you who may be familiar with that. I don't even know if they still use those anymore, but uh, it was kind of this shape here. So in my mind, that indicated to me that there was definitely a weapon in play. Again, he's not just peeking going, ooh, what's happening? I fire two rounds. Um, there's a picture here. You can see what the uh, impacts look like on the window. All right, so again, he's got me blocked in here. I, I don't know, I'm assuming that he started kicking his legs and hit the gear shifter. Maybe the passenger threw it in the gear for some strange reason, I don't know. But whatever the reasoning was, their car went forward and smacked the back corner of this one. Whether this traffic was starting to flow or not, again, I don't know. That was not my uh, fixation at the moment. So all I know is they ended up crashed together and there was enough space back here that I was able to actually turn and get around. All right, so now that there's a little bit of space in front of us, whatever the means was that that, that happened, I, I started to cut across. And as I drive past and behind their vehicle, I see the passenger bail out and run across all three lanes of traffic, the direction that I'm heading kind of away a little bit. So immediately think to myself, so I guess he didn't die. The back passenger side door opens and the driver like tumbles out onto the ground along with a whole bunch of bags. They're paper bags, plastic bags, styrofoam food containers, just all kinds of stuff tumbles out onto the ground. As I keep going past, I pull into a bank parking lot and find a space and kind of reassess. And I'm looking and seeing what's going on. So at this point, the passenger then comes back to the area with, I would say no less than 30 people and they absolutely swarm the car. And I remember watching people walk off in every single direction. They were picking up bags and boxes and all the crap that fell out of the car. I don't even know if they were going into the car and taking stuff. They swarmed it like ants on a dead bug and magically just disappeared. And there was only just a few people left. Some of them, they stayed on the sidewalk and were helping the uh, driver who I could, he was wearing a white shirt and I could see blood on him. And they were using something to help kind of put pressure on it. At this point, JSO started showing up from every single direction and it took them pro a good probably 10 minutes to get any sort of order on the scene with the traffic and all the people around and everything going on. Uh, I put my gun in the cup holder. I stepped out of the vehicle. Two uh, JSO officers approached me with their pistols out. I had my hands up. I said, it was me, the guns in the car. They kind of looked at each other, holstered up, walked away and went back to the scene. So I guess they realized that I wasn't still a threat. I, I'm assuming they kind of figured out maybe what was going on. I don't know. So they went back and dealt with that and I just kind of hung out and uh, waited until they basically got to me to get on with the investigation to figure out what happened. So before we uh, get into that part with the everything that happened after the shooting, I want to kind of break down what exactly happened during the shooting so you know where, where did the bullets go, what happened, and uh, what was the situation there. So. Let's put some parentheses or brackets around everything from what I said from the, the time that I saw the revolver till the time that my hearing came back and I started moving the vehicle. So as soon as I saw the revolver, uh, instant auditory exclusion, could not hear anything. I was so hyper-focused that there's a weapon, got that shot of adrenaline. For those of you that are aware that happens in uh, high critical stress incidents, you don't hear anything. Hunters experience it as well. You, you got a big buck that you're focused on trying to shoot. They don't even hear the shot without hearing protection. Nothing happens with that. So everything kind of had like a red tint. It's go time now. This is, this is life or death. So again, I fired one round at the passenger. It hit him here in his left collarbone, which it was still enough to knock him back. That's what, when he hit the window, that's what caused it to crack. And again, there was some blood. The, remember the driver's butt and legs were right here at the time. When he got hit with the revolver, he went like this and apparently he didn't have good trigger discipline and actually shot the driver in his butt cheek, cranked a round off into it. The driver, who again was in the back like this, both of my rounds went through the window. Again, you could see in the picture the grouping there, they hit him in his left arm. He then took his gun and fired a third round through. Mine stopped. His round went all the way through his arm and into the back seat of the vehicle. So I'm guessing that's probably when he maybe started kicking, hit the gear shifter, car went forward and smashed into the other one. So basically uh, I did the math and I think that's 120% accuracy if I shot three rounds and they were hit five times. Still pretty proud of that one. It's a very <laughs> awkward situation, but again, important uh, trigger discipline, especially if you're operating around multiple people. And so 
all of that, again, the, the, the seeing the gun firing the rounds literally happened this fast. I came up, bang, 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 and that was it. That was the whole incident. Yet that whole, uh, I don't know what you call it, where time just kind of slows down when you're in that state too, where I had time to have thoughts of, okay, headshot on the passenger, where's the driver? Okay, shooting, now let's get back to reality. Uh, time dilation, whatever you want to call it, I don't know what the, the, the terminology is, so it, it just baffles me looking back how it felt like it was an eternity, but it literally happened that fast. So that was the, uh, the actual incident shooting situation. So what happened next? Well, once the uh, scene was calmed down, the ambulance came and took both of them away. They got kind of traffic under control. My car was out of the road, so they had to get the other two cars out that were uh, now crashed. So the very first thing I did was called my dad. And again, young 20 something year old kid. First time experiencing this here. Now being in combat overseas is a completely different situation than being here in the United States. So do not ever get it uh, confused. There's a whole different set of uh, rules of engagement and things that you have to be considerate of. So just understand that it is not the same thing. So I called my dad, his immediate words to me after being a 30 something year retired police veteran tells me, don't say anything to anyone, I'm calling a lawyer. Well, for the first time in my life, I probably should listen to my dad when he tells me something like that. So eventually I get handcuffed, I'm put in the back of a police car. The incident happened, uh, probably 11 in the afternoon. So probably about three o'clock, I ended up at the police station. They put me in an interview room. They took her as well and had her in a separate interview room. While we were there, apparently she heard talking from where the room she was in. Uh, apparently it was the state attorney or assistant state attorney, whoever at the time came in and was speaking with the detective. And essentially the detective had it figured out what was going on, that it was a, basically a self-defense situation. And the state attorney wanted to press the issue and essentially said that I was a white guy on the wrong side of town that just shot two black guys and he was gonna move forward with it. That he was gonna push the issue and turn it into whatever he was gonna turn it into. So they come in to interview me, read me Miranda, and I said, you know what, I'm, I'm not gonna say anything. I know I did nothing wrong, I know what happened, but the problem is, if you're not aware, after a critical incident, you can have what's called critical incident amnesia. And you may not remember all the details right then and there. You may have to get two or three nights of sleep afterwards and then, ah, I remember this happening now. So this is typically why even after law enforcement's involved in a shooting, there is no immediate interview. You're sent home, they take all your stuff and you're on administrative leave and you have a, a protocol you have to follow. So I, I didn't want it. Anything that you say at that point is now set in stone. And it's gonna go back on if you end up in court and they're gonna go, well, you said this. And you're like, well, I remember a detail that happened now. I'm like, oh, you're changing your story. Why are you lying? So again, I said nothing. I want an attorney. At about 1.30 in the morning that night, next day, uh, I was actually finally transported to the jail and I was charged with two counts of aggravated battery with a deadly weapon. Looking back now, I should have probably been charged with attempted murder based on the circumstances and them trying to push forward. But again, this was at the discretion of the detective filing the charges because again, he, he knew what was going on and I'm not going to say what he told me because he said he would deny it anyway, but essentially he understood the circumstances and what was happening and wished me luck. So I spent a week in jail. This happened on Saturday. I was booked in 1 30 a.m. on Sunday and I was in jail for that night. I went to first appearance in the morning. My bond was set at $200,003. The attorneys that my dad hired had a bond reduction hearing. It was reduced to a $20,000 cash bond. I was required to turn over all the remaining of my firearms to my dad and I was confined to the base. I was not allowed to leave and be out and about. So over the course of the next six months, I had to call every Monday to find out if I had court on Tuesday and they kept getting pushed back and I'd call and they'd say next week, next week, next week for six months straight. Eventually one day I get a phone call from my attorney that said, hey, the state attorney is uh, dropping the charges. It's self-defense. Here's a uh, letter proving you were innocent and uh, good luck. So it turns out what ended up happening was that first state attorney that wanted to press the issue decided he didn't want to do it anymore. So he passed it off to somebody else. That somebody else was a Marine reservist that got deployed. So clearly he was not able to take the case. So he handed it off to the next guy. The next guy looked at it and went, this is bull crap. I'm not prosecuting this. And again, 
ruled in self-defense. I then had to go through the process of trying to get my firearms back from JSO. I had all the, the uh, serial numbers for all my guns at the time memorized because I did not have that many of them, so that was easy. Uh, I had to get my car out of impound because they were processing it for evidence. That was it, that's the, uh, that's the story there. So definitely a unique situation. Not every day you uh, have bad guys shooting each other while you're shooting at them. So, so a lot of people usually get a kick out of that part of the story. It was pretty, I will say traumatizing at the time. Uh, I was just more concerned, like I know I didn't do anything wrong. And if I have to go to court and my life path moving forward is now being decided by six people in a room and let's just say they all don't like guns and I'm gonna get in trouble and my life is now gonna be ruined for not doing anything wrong. And that was probably the hardest thing to deal with that I had to worry about that. I'm thankful that it turned out the way it did. Obviously, uh, I work in a job where I'm around firearms all the time. I own firearms, I can shoot them. I'm not a felon, I have no, uh, no issues there. So anyway, that's the, uh, that's the story. Also, uh, I'm sure somebody may ask, the firearm that I was using at the time was a Glock 23. It was loaded with Winchester Black Talons that I had recently just actually purchased from a gun show. They were fairly outdated at that time, but they obviously were still functional and got the job done. So anyway, uh, that's my story. So hopefully you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Again, thank you very much for reaching a thousand subscribers. I know I'm a little bit behind on the times. My videos are scheduled out ahead of time in advance so that I'm able to uh, maintain work in my 40 hour week job, do stuff at home and keep up with the channel. So again, thank you for watching. I greatly appreciate it. And uh, we'll catch you in the next video.